Meet Tom. He's a young earth creationist associated with a group of preachers called the Truth Defenders. Strictly speaking, however, he isn't one of them, though he will on occasion join them on their little escapades in Santa Monica. While Tom is a reasonably nice fellow despite being an ardent creationist, he still bears a trait without which creationism cannot survive, and that trait is arrogance. Let's have a closer look at some of that arrogance. Okay. Nothing cannot explode or expand or whatever, or bounce as some now say. It is useful to first define what nothing is. While the philosophical definition might be easy to come up with, we're dealing with the physical world, so our definition of nothing has to be concordant with physical reality. If you have a system to remove all the matter and all the energy, you've essentially removed everything that physically exists, including the four fundamental forces. What you're left with is a vacuum, which is as close to the philosophical definition of nothing as you can get. But even then, you still have the vacuum energy in the system, which cannot be reduced unless you put stuff into the vacuum. Now you've asserted that nothing cannot expand, but space can and is, and since the vacuum is an inherent property of space, the vacuum can expand as well. It is always important to define your terms in science and avoid vagaries like nothing. So where did your matter come from? All of the matter in the universe is essentially a condensed form of energy. We know this from mass energy equivalence, and we've been able to convert one to the other with the two nuclear forces via the manipulation of gluons, W+, W-, and Z bosons. These are also naturally occurring processes. The role of these processes in the Big Bang Theory is played following the inflationary epoch, approximately 10 to the minus 4 seconds after the Big Bang. With the expansion of the universe causing temperatures to fall to a frosty 10 trillion Kelvin, the threshold temperature of leptons and quarks, the fundamental constituents of matter, is reached. Three minutes and 20 seconds later, the universe expands to the point where the temperature cools sufficiently to allow protons and neutrons to form, and there are your first hydrogen atoms. Those get attracted under the influence of gravity to form structures of extreme density and heat, eventually resulting in quantum tunneling, a process that, contrary to what one of your idiotic subscribers thinks, does not accelerate light speed, which is impossible by the way, but among other things allows fusion to take place. This results in the birth of a star, which over its lifespan will fuse hydrogen into helium until it runs out of hydrogen before proceeding to fuse helium into carbon. Then, if the star is large enough, it will continue fusing elements into heavier ones. Neon, oxygen, silicon, and finally iron. The mass of the iron causes the star to collapse into itself, releasing a shockwave that blows up the star and sends its contents flying out into space. The extreme energy eruptions in these supernovae allow for neutron capture reactions to take place, which are essentially nuclear reactions that absorb neutrons into an atom. The new isotopes are unstable, however, so the neutrons decay into protons, turning them into elements higher on the periodic table, and forming what are essentially the constituents of everything you've ever seen. So, in summary, all matter comes from energy, and energy, in accordance with the first law of thermodynamics, is eternal. Christians believe in miracles, but we have a miracle maker. Evolutionists do not have one. Paul Davies, he's an evolutionist, he says, the Big Bang represents the instantaneous suspension of physical laws, the sudden abrupt flash of lawlessness that allowed something to come out of nothing. It represents a true miracle. I'm going to ignore the fact that you just made a false dichotomy between the grown-ups that you refer to as evolutionists and Christianity, because I'm sure that you're already more than aware that the majority of people who accept evolution are Christians, and the majority of Christians accept evolution. And instead I'm going to deal with your quote, mine. The original quote did not say, the Big Bang represents the instantaneous suspension of physical laws. It said, its creation represents the instantaneous suspension of physical laws. He also does not add that this represents any kind of miracle, and even went on to explain the problem with the primordial universe and the various models that have been derived to solve that problem. What Paul Davies was referring to in that passage of his book, The Edge of Infinity, was the initial singularity from which the universe expanded. The actual expansion of the universe, colloquially referred to as the Big Bang, itself violates no physical laws, but the aforementioned primordial universe is as yet not fully understood. 
The primary problem with this initial singularity, as with all singularities, is that space is infinitely curved and time is infinitely dilated, so what we're looking at is essentially a zero-dimensional infinite regress, which current mathematical frameworks are unequipped to handle. It's possible that as with the formation of general relativity, which required Einstein to abandon a traditional Euclidean coordinate system in favor of a non-Euclidean geometry, the formation of a theory that can describe the singularity may likewise require us to shift our mathematical framework. The invocation of a miracle, however, is neither necessary nor implied by the data. Quantum physics, with its quantum fluctuation, is essentially something from nothing. Aha, so you are familiar with quantum fluctuations. This ties back to the earlier topic of the vacuum, whose inseparable energy is made up of particle-antiparticle pairs spontaneously popping in and out of existence via pair creation and annihilation, a process which itself is a consequence of the time-energy uncertainty principle. Seeing as you are aware that this process exists and is very well understood, it remains a mystery to me as to why you're so appalled at the notion that something can come from nothing. It can, and it does, all the time. There are only three possibilities of where the universe came from. Number one, that it created itself in it, or number two, that it always existed, or that it was created. So we have to ask, can something create itself? No. Can nothing create something? No. The law of cause and effect states that for every effect there must be an equal or greater cause, and nothing cannot be greater than something. As for always existing, the second law of thermodynamics exposes this is wrong. I've already explained how something can come from nothing, and until you explain exactly why the second law of thermodynamics prohibits the universe from having always existed, you have no case. What really bothers me here, however, is your pretension that your philosophical ponderings on causality are even remotely comparable to the rigor and discipline required to even understand the subject under discussion, much less disprove it. I've said it before and I'll say it again. Intuition is meaningless. Basic classical mechanics, the field of physics that describes relatively mundane phenomena, is something that easily escapes our intuitions. The fact that the accelerations of a falling elephant and a falling laptop are equal is not intuitive in any sense, yet this is one of the fundamental cornerstones of Newtonian mechanics. Now move past the mundane into the high energy, or the extremely small, or the extremely dense, and now you're entering fields which our minds, having evolved in a mundane world, cannot hope to comprehend. Only the language of mathematics can ever hope to probe these fields. With regard to the origin of the universe, this is the highest energy, smallest, and densest system that you can possibly imagine, so alien that even our mathematics fail. And you think that philosophy, which fails even at the classical level, can even come close to helping us understand this? The origin of the universe is a field of study that requires an intensive understanding of various aspects of quantum field theory, including quantum electrodynamics and quantum chromodynamics, as well as supersymmetry and relativity, and each of these areas of study require a mastery of the mathematical prerequisites, including differential and partial differential equations, non-Euclidean geometry, vector calculus, linear algebra, and operator algebra, just to name a few. This is the arrogance that underlies creationism, the notion that a layperson can sit back and idly think about a discipline that takes years to understand, much less master, and disprove it with facile, simple-minded arguments.